In 2002, a 19-year-old British trash collector named Michael Carroll had a pretty good day. In fact, he had a day that others would say is the best thing, the best day they could ever dream of having. Because you see, on that day in 2002, Michael Carroll decided to check an old lottery ticket in his wallet in hopes that maybe he'd won a few pounds, maybe enough to buy a beer or two with the boys after work. But he didn't win a pound or two. Instead, he won 10 million pounds, the equivalent of about $14.5 million. Most people would definitely label something like that happening as a, a very lucky day. And indeed, Michael Carroll did just that. He didn't bother going into work. I'm not sure I can blame him for that. Instead, he rushed down to the lottery office, got his picture taken, got his check, threw it in the bank, and from that point on, he later wrote, the day ended up being not so lucky after all. Some say that his young age, only 19 when he won all that money, was the root of the problem. But you don't have to dig very deep to find stories of others who are much older and supposedly much wiser, whose fates mirrored young Mr. Carroll's. That day, his out-of-control life began. He bought, within the next week, five luxury cars, was under contract for three houses, and was saying yes to anyone, whether they were friends or family or not, for financial help for any reason they could cook up. It wasn't long before his boredom, caused by being without a job, found an outlet in drinking and drugs. Every girlfriend he had that he was sure loved him, in fact, ended up only loving his money. And as you might have guessed, within eight years, that was all gone. Even after selling the houses for less than he'd paid for them years before in that blind orgy of acquisition, by 2010, he was flat broke, homeless, addicted to drugs and alcohol. And now, on top of everything, headed to prison after being convicted of fraud in a check forgery scheme he perpetrated with some so-called friends who, who assured him that that could keep him in this lifestyle that he'd become accustomed to. Now, when you hear stories of other lottery winners or sports figures or others who, who come into big money and see it destroying their lives in the next few months or years, the last theme to come out of it is gratitude. More than one person in that situation has literally cursed that supposedly lucky day and wished it had never happened at all. But not Michael Carroll. In an interview he, he gave a couple of years after he got out of prison, gratitude was the central theme of his story. Not, not gratitude just for having a few years of good times with seemingly unlimited cash, total luxury, unbounded privilege, but instead gratitude for the downfall that followed. Gratitude for the addiction and alcoholism that ended with sobriety. For the time in prison that taught him to cherish freedom and family. For the wife he met a year after getting out who had to love him for himself because he certainly wasn't carting around a pile of cash anymore. And especially he noted gratitude now for his young daughter and the home he and his wife, the family that they were building that was a, a far cry from empty luxury and pointless wealth. Since leaving prison, Carol had worked mostly in delivery, food delivery, but he'd recently formed a message delivery service that was prospering. He, he made it a point to hire people like himself, people working through struggles and, and needing a helping hand, a second chance. So many people whose stories are like Michael Carroll's end their tales on notes of regret and bitterness and blame. But his story continues, centered on gratitude. We find gratitude in the strangest places among the most unexpected people, don't we? Please stand now, in body or spirit, for the reading of the gospel from Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 19. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men with a skin disease approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet, 
and thanked him. And that man was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? So where are the other nine? Did none of them return to give glory to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Once again, we find Jesus doing what most folks of his day in his home territory of Galilee think he shouldn't be doing. What they frown on and and would never do themselves. He's going through Samaria on his way to Jerusalem. You see, Samaria is right in what should be the middle of that journey from from Galilee in the northern region of Israel to Jerusalem further south. It's logical to go through Samaria when making the trip. It's the quickest route. It has the fewest hills, the best availability of water wells and the like. But a good Jew from Galilee, well, they just wouldn't do it. Instead, they'd take either the route that goes by the Mediterranean coast or or maybe the route that goes further east along the Jordan River Sure, it would likely add a day or two of travel time, but you'd avoid Samaria and all that that entailed. Because Samaria is filled with, you guessed it, Samaritans. And there's no people, including the despised Romans, that a good Jew back then hated more than the Samaritans. And frankly, the feeling was often mutual. It's kind of strange. They're they're sort of cousins in a sense, descended from the same 12 tribes that re-entered the Holy Land after the exodus from slavery in Egypt. They share the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, as their scripture, although the Samaritans rejected the prophets and the other writings that came later and had been incorporated into the Hebrew Bible over the years. But the trouble between them really went back over five centuries before Jesus appeared on the scene. As the people of Judea were taken into captivity and exiled by the Babylonians, the people living in Samaria were allowed to stay. The Judeans, after they returned from that exile, were convinced that the Samaritans were untouched by the event because they had collaborated with the conquerors. And during those years of exile, when Babylon brought in Gentiles, outsiders, to take over that land, the Samaritans had intermarried with them. And that was seen as unforgivable by most Jews of the day. And religiously, the the Samaritans didn't believe that the temple in Jerusalem was the center of their relationship with God either. Instead, they had shrines and temples built in various places in their territory, including on mountains that were important sites of faith and history for both groups. Take a moment and, and think of whatever nationality that Americans might despise the most today. Multiply the bad will by a factor of, say, 10 or so, and then plop them down in the center of the country. And you'll get a sense of what the Jewish-Samaritan relationship was like in Jesus' day. Yet once again, there he is, traveling right through Samaria on his way to Jerusalem. It's happened before, you might remember. Probably more times than are even recorded in the Gospels. We've talked before about that Samaritan woman at the well who who hears Jesus and in her gratitude becomes his first evangelist. And then her town, Sychar, becomes the first town, Jewish or Samaritan, to gratefully receive Jesus and his message. On this trip through the area, in our gospel reading this morning, we find Jesus in a kind of no man's land, a place on the border between Samaria and Galilee that isn't really either considered Jewish or Samaritan territory. Most of its occupants are persons who have been rejected by one nation or the other. So they end up here where those distinctions of Jew or Samaritan no longer really matter. In our account this morning, Jesus comes across ten men with leprosy, as some translations refer to it. Leprosy in the Bible really could be any number of skin disorders, but any of them would have made the men... Samaritan or Jew, unclean and unable to live in the towns and cities of their own nation. So they become residents of this border region, where the things that at one point would have made them hate one another no longer matter. And now a thing that they hate, a skin disease they share, causes them to be rejected and suddenly unites them in a strange camaraderie. 
As Jesus is approaching a village, the men call out to him. Even in their isolated, rejected life, they've heard that this is a man who can, who can change, perhaps, their circumstances. Who can, I don't know, maybe change their lives. They follow the rules that, that both societies have imposed on them. They keep their distance. To approach someone when you've been declared unclean would have been a violation of the laws of both of those societies. And, and whoever they approached would become ceremonially unclean as well. This interaction with Jesus isn't face-to-face. It, it doesn't involve Jesus offering a, a gentle healing touch. It's, it's born out of rejection and distance. It's communicated by shouting back and forth. There are no whispered tones of compassion. Instead, they shout, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And from a distance, he does just that. From a distance caused by their physical and social agony, Jesus does just that. In many scenes of Jesus' healing, there's a lot more to the encounter than we see here. Dramatic demonstrations to those in the crowd, those who have been healed, picking up their sick beds and walking home. Poultices of saliva and mud being applied to a blind man's eyes, but not here. Here there are only words. Just seven simple words from Jesus show there that day. And and all of us hearing the account today realize it too that what has happened is a miraculous healing. Go and show yourselves to the priests. Those present that day knew that healing had taken place. The men who were healed knew their ordeal of sickness and uncleanness and rejection was over. They knew it because they immediately turn around and head off to the priests. You see, to return to society, to regain the status of being clean once more, to be an acceptable part of the community again, you have to have verification by the temple priests that your leprosy, your skin condition is gone. If it wasn't gone, they couldn't have even gotten near the priests. So the moment Jesus speaks those words, the men see and know that they've been healed And without a word, an acknowledgement, or an offer of thanks, they turn to rush off to the priests. We really can't be too hard on them, I guess. We've all forgotten to say thank you at some point, haven't we? After receiving a gift or a favor or even some kind words, we think nothing about it and go on about our business too as if it's expected, as if it's deserved. Sure, this is bigger than an ordinary little thing like that, of course. And understandably, the men were excited They rushed off to finish the paperwork, if you will, to to follow the process that would allow them to return to a normal life. But still, they rushed off without a word, without a backward glance, thinking only of themselves, of their future, and, and not at all about the one who made it possible. Well, nine out of the ten men did anyway. Only one of the ten, the moment he saw he was healed, took the time to actually thank the provider of his healing, the one who had blessed him and restored him to health. And the one that did was the least likely of all. Gratitude came from the person in the place you might least expect it. There at Jesus' feet was the unexpected man offering the gratitude to his healer the others couldn't be bothered with. And that man was a Samaritan. It's unexpected, actually. You see, he couldn't just go see the priests in Jerusalem and be pronounced officially healed, officially cured. He wasn't a Jew. And and the Samaritans didn't have a, a central religious authority like that, the equivalent system to have his return to health, to cleanness, signed off on. He would have to convince the leaders of his community and all the people, too. And without an official religious proclamation of cleanness... His future wasn't that certain, not as clear as it was for the other nine. Of the ten, he was the one most likely still in for a struggle, still in for rejection. Yet only he of the ten is at Jesus' feet, spilling out the gratitude that fills his heart after the healing. Author Mike Tidd writes of an experience that taught him a lesson about all of this while he was still in college. 
One day a knock came at the back door of the house he and his roommates were renting. He opened it to find an older man, hunched over, ratty clothes, unshaved, eyes showing signs of advanced cataracts, carrying a, a wicker basket with some wilted, unappealing vegetables that he offered for sale. Feeling sorry for the man and hoping to get him off his back porch as quickly as he could, Mike bought a few carrots and turnips that had seen better days, planning on immediately just throwing them away. The man left, but, but the next week on the same day at the same time, the knock came again. This time, not only did Mike buy a few vegetables, he, he struck up a conversation with the man. He offered him a cup of coffee. Over the coffee, he learned that the man had been waiting for several years to have his cataracts treated at the local university hospital. He couldn't do any regular paid work in his near-blind condition, and he lived in a run-down shack across the tracks that Mike had driven by before, wondering who or why anyone would possibly live there. Mr. Roth was the man's name, he learned, and, and as Mr. Roth crossed his legs at the kitchen table, Mike noticed the holes in his shoes, and he knew what he had to do. The next day, he went down to the local department store, bought several pairs of shoes in what he estimated was Mr. Roth's size. And then when he figured Mr. Roth would be out on his round selling vegetables so he wouldn't be seen by him, he dropped off the bag on his rickety front porch. The next week, when Mr. Roth knocked at his back door, he, he seemed to be smiling more. And, and Mike figured he knew why. He invited him in and commented on his cheerful attitude, and, and Mr. Roth replied that he'd had the best week you could possibly imagine. Then he crossed his legs, and, and Mike saw those same old hole-filled shoes he'd worn before. Disappointed and perplexed, but not wanting to give anything away, he asked Mr. Todd what he was thankful for. The older man told the story of coming home to find a bag of wonderful shoes sitting on right there, right on his front porch. So, Mike pressed, so, so you're grateful that you got some fine new shoes? Oh, no, that's not the end of the story, Mr. Roth replied. That's, that's not what 